Now, as remember, practically speaking, we want to teach fix our basics so that they are sort of in complex coordinates. Yeah. So, uh, so I want to describe the gauge fixing of, uh, of, the, of, of the deformorphism invariance in, on the worksheet. We want to put the metric in complex coordinates. So that in complex coordinates is essentially the ZDZ bar. Uh, this means in complex coordinates to set HZZ and HZ bar Z bar to zero, which I can do with these delta functions. But if we want to work in general coordinates, uh, which is also convenient to in order to figure out how to parameterize the different possible complex structures on the surface, it's better to just pick some reference metric. Some familiar reference metrics parameterized by whatever parameters I cannot get rid of by diffeomorphisms. I mean, denote them just as some. Piece. Okay. We'll be more specific about their nature later. And say, okay, I want H to be the same as this up to a rescaling, a wire scaling. So a way I can impose that is that I can pick some auxiliary fields. Uh, with the property that H uh, that their trace with respect to the reference matrix is zero. Okay. And then put a gauge fixing for the form uh, okay. So it should be clear that this is gonna kill all the parts of the matrix which are not proportional to this reference metric. Okay. And then I can just build the rest of my ghost action as we did last week. So it still is gonna be some reference metric. So by using the thermophisms, we can, there is a theorem that we can make uh, we can always write, uh, we can eliminate almost all the degrees of freedom of the metric up to while rescaling, up to just a finite number, which parameterize the, the complex structure of the surface. So if you want to parameterize the way you glue, you glue your surface together by flat, flat metric patches with uh, holomorphic code transformations. Uh, so to take into account the fact that we can have this so it means that every family can be, every metric can be uh, reduced up to the form of to some reference metric, which characterizes, which is characterized by this choice of complex structure. If I don't want to commit myself to a specific way of parameterizing the, these complex structures yet, I'll just take this family of reference metrics and leave it at that. And uh, So, oh, let me also put a, let me write it in a way that is actually the form of invariant. invariant. Okay. Now, what sort of uh, B and C ghosts we need to complete this into 
a nice, uh, a nice object, a nice uh, action which has this, this, this topological symmetry. So uh, last week we saw that we would add terms that look like the I, uh, the A, uh, F I, the A. So we we need to introduce a Gauss for every group symmetry that I want to get rid of, and an anti-Gauss for every uh, another Gauss for the constraint. So in this case, it means that we're going to introduce some B, A B constraint this way, which are going to be the partners of this bosonic capital B's. We're going to introduce some C A. Actually, the A, which are dual to the vector fields with defined diffeomorphisms. So the ghost action essentially looks like this. Because when I do a diffeomorphism, this changes by essentially the A, C, B. So F prime here, C, A, F, I is really the, the, the sort of the derivative. So you can sort of see that this action is going to be symmetric. Understand transformation which changes B by capital B. And changes uh, everything else that is the metric. This way. Mm -hmm. Can you explain how you came up with these actions? Like, what's the motivation? Uh, it's just I'm just writing down literally the the i f i uh, plus the i a f i c a that I discussed last week. This is literally uh, the same. I think this is right. But you can also check that this action is indeed invariant under the sort of VSD uh, symmetry. OK. So a nice feature of this action is that it's actually well invariant again. So the, the ghost introduced in the ghost has not spoiled Classic, at least classically well invariants, and uh, now we'll have to check if it's still, if it's there quantum mechanically. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. No, delta C, uh, I forgot I should call them Q, sorry. Well, diffeomorphisms, uh, not quite, because diffeomorphisms do not commute. You remember that Q, C, A is in general supposed to be the structure constant. Uh, C, 
So in this case, I think this means uh, something I didn't write it down in my notes, so I'm reconstructing it from memory. Don't fully trust me on this. It's probably something like this. Uh, I likely had to, there might be some other terms uh, where the contractions work the other way. Uh, it's a coefficient. Uh, you see, when I do a, a lead derivative to vector fields, right? So what do I do? What is the lead derivative of? Uh, I think this is supposed to be the lead derivative of v1 a v a v2 v minus v2 a the A, the one B. So, and to pass exactly what this means, uh, but yeah, I think it's likely to be this. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. It should it should be it should be needed to take care of this uh, for the variation of the square root of g, I think. Uh, and of whatever part of the metric is actually hidden inside this covariant derivative. So it actually it's probably a, a little bit of a cumbersome calculation. Uh, but uh, it's a good exercise in the general relativity like uh, calculations. So, okay, this was, I did just this just to show essentially that this ghost action can be while invariant. Uh, so, It's far from, again, it's not completely obvious. Uh, when you do a transformation, there are some terms that come out from the uh, covariant derivative. And sometimes they come from square root of h. And they cancel each other if b is actually traceless, which I thought I'd written and must have, I must have erased. So this is also another exercise. <laughs> you probably have too many exercises, but time is what it is. So, okay. So now we that we uh, well done things in in sort of the general uh, setup. We can just go study what happens locally. Uh, so let's do the first thing I want to understand if, if is to check what is the while anomaly for the for the ghosts to get finally get that minus twenty six I've been promising you for for a week now. So to do that I want to go on the cylinder. Once I'm on the cylinder, I can just take my flat matrix, go in compass coordinates, forget about all this general setup. So in complex coordinates, essentially my ghosts are B, Z, 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 B, Z bar, Z bar, C, Z bar. This is a conventional way to, to write them. And once they're written like that, the action becomes, so these are usually not just as B, and these are just not usually as C, and this is the conjugate variables. So the action is written as b del s bar 
C. There's there's bar plus complex concrete. This is the ghost action. Okay. So it's just the thing over there. Uh, written in complex coordinates. Um, perhaps the only point that deserves still being mentioned here is that uh, so we, 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 we get rid of the, of the capital B field to impose our gauge fixing condition. So at some, you know, on occasion, we will need to figure out what is the PRC transformation of our ghost. But because we got rid of the, of the, cap, of the field capital B, uh, we need to work a little bit harder. We don't need to do much harder. Uh, there is essentially a trick, which is the following. In principle, you could replace your, your, your e to the i, b, a, b, h, uh, a, b, with something like this. But this is just some constant. See, because the capital B field has zero uh, is Q closed. Whenever you have a cost action, you can add whatever function of B you want to it without changing anything. This is actually used very often in electromagnetism, uh, where you, people use Essentially, this corresponds to not having a delta function, but having a more complicated function of your gauge fixing condition, which still has the property that integrates to one along an orbit. It's like this mirrored version of your gauge fixing condition, or an averaging over many different gauge fixing conditions. The only reason this is useful is that now you can replace these when you integrate it away with variation with respect to this eta. Okay? And uh, put in front of everything. Now, what, what this eta is doing is essentially it's making your HZZ non-zero equal to eta. So if you turn on an eta ZZ, so essentially your BZZ can be replaced by del over del eta ZZ, which is just a change of the reference matrix uh, in which you turn on a little ZZ component. So this is essentially the same as inserting the stress tensor. So effectively, uh, when we get rid of capital B, the BRC transformation would, would be amended to something like this. Okay. Which makes a lot of sense. Uh, the T, the, the, the vanishing of T was the equation of motion for the metric. We got rid of the metric. Uh, but we don't want to get rid of the equation of motion for the metric. This is telling you that the equation of motion is actually Q exact, so it holds whenever you do things that are BST closed. Um, okay, so this is the action. Something else we can get out of the general expression, which is useful, is that we can get the stress tensor, the contribution to, of the ghost to the stress tensor. Because the metric enters the ghost action, there will be a contribution to the stress tensor from the ghosts. If I write it in a, so classically, can be written like this. Okay? So this is, uh, you know, it's the same, the same spirit as we got the stress tensor for matter as minus one half the x, the x. Okay? So 
this quadratic expression in the ghosts uh, you see C behaves more or less like a vector field B is as, as a two component uh, tensor and T is a two component tensor uh, now there is something else which is useful to to consider there is a the, the system of ghosts that we are that added have a nice symmetry, which is called ghost number. As you see, the action is invariant under the transformation which rotates B in one direction and C in the opposite direction. So the ghost number symmetry. Uh, so there is a there is a current, there is a ghost there is a symmetry that rotates B and C in opposite direction, and there is a conserved current associated to this symmetry. And it can be written as simply CB. So this current has properties that are very similar to the current which we wrote for the three bosons. Okay. So this is associated to translations of the three boson. This is associated to rotations of the BC ghosts. But it has a as a crucial difference from this one, this current is anomalous. So the symmetry, ghost number symmetry, actually has an anomaly. And the ghost number symmetry is not quite conserved. Mm -hmm. Sure, 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 sure. So the ghost number symmetry sends uh, C to C and B to minus B. It's a bosonic symmetry, nothing fancy. And the PST symmetry is has charge one under this ghost number symmetry. So when I say this is anomalous, it means again that the action is invariant under rotation under this transformation, but the uh, measure is actually not. The measure the B the C has just it, trans, it, it almost goes back to itself, but it goes back to itself up to a phase, up to a, uh, a scaling. Which means that this, cons, this, cons, this current is going to be conserved up to some number that depends on, this, on your space, on the shape of your space. Much like the uh, trace of the stress tensor was not quite zero, but it was this. Uh, uh, now, I'm sorry. C is used both to denote the central charge and the C ghost. And uh, I, I hope it won't be confusing. Usually, one is, ghost, is the Grassmann even, one got a Grassmann odd. So, usually, it's pretty easy to figure out which one one is talking about. For example, the left hand side is Grassmann even, the right hand side is Grassmann even, so that has to be the central charge. Uh, and for the ghosts, one can show something similar that's sort of for the ghost number current that uh, it is not quite zero, but is again proportional to the curvature of your manifold. Which means on the cylinder would be fine. But when we start studying nice worksheets, uh, that would be interesting. OK, so how do we quantize this, this ghost system? Everything was pretty much classical until now. Um, I will cut a few corners because we have only a week and a half left almost. Well, two weeks, kind of. But uh, I will just do a Fourier expansion. Ah, well, one, one corner I should not cut. See, what, what are the equations of motion for the ghosts that come from this action? Well, they're just del bar B equal to 0, del bar C equal to 0. So B and C are holomorphic, classically. So if I expand them in modes,
on the cylinder. Quantization will mean essentially proposing some anti-commutational relations for these modes. And the one that follows from this uh, sort of first order action, very simple. Okay. So, as speaking, the meaning of this uh, commutation relation is that if I do an equal equal time uh, commutator, anti commutator, I have to get delta function. So all of this is completely parallel to what we did to the, for the boson, for the free boson. That's why I'm cutting a few corners, but uh, most calculations can be done exactly the same way as we did the free boson calculations. Now the, the, the first tricky point is to pick uh, your vacuum. So when I want to build the Hilbert space for this door, we're gonna build it starting from some vacuum building up. There's a there's a little bit of ambiguity. I mean, most modes have either positive or negative energy. So we can pick our vacuum to just kill by the modes that lower the energy. Uh, except for B0 and C0. B0 and C0 don't uh, raise or lower the energy. They to commute to one. So that means that actually the vacuum for the system of Gauss is degenerate. Uh, there is some ground state. Which, uh, if you want this kill by all the positive modes, sorry, the negative modes, positive modes of B. Sorry, I hope this is legible. And then from this one, I can build a new, a second ground state by acting with C0. Okay. And vice versa, if you act with B0 on this guy, you go back to the other one. And then everything else can be built out of these states by acting with uh, modes with, uh, which raise the energy. Now, although this is the most natural ground state for the system, uh, I mean, it is the ground state for the ghosts on the, on the cylinder. And it's also the state which uh, naturally appears during quantization, meaning that if you start with a, with a before gauge fixing with your theory in some, some ground state of the matter system, and then you introduce your ghost. Uh, your ghost will end up sitting in, in this ground state, actually precise this ground, precisely this ground state. Now, way to understand a little bit better the, 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 the reason we had this C0 and B0 there is that the cylinder has uh, diffeomorphisms which uh, simply rotate it or translate it. Uh, these different prisms do not change the matrix. Okay? So it, it means that the gauge fixing on the cylinder did not actually fix completely the different prisms. We are still left with, the, with these extra translations in time, which are actually infinite volumes, so uh, they can get you some trouble. Um, now, So this, the, the existence of these extra diffeomorphisms that have been not, not being gauge fixed is directly connected to the existence of some zero modes for the, for the ghosts. Now, 
uh, when you try to define correlation functions on the cylinder, You, you need to somehow get rid of these extra, uh, extra diffeomorphisms, or at least uh, make sure that you understand what, what effect do they have. So perhaps it's, it's best to go back to the original, uh, but to the original description of the gauge fixing, right? So I had this integral of the of some, some symmetry group or a B or the ghosts. Uh, something like that. Now suppose that for some reason um, I wanted to uh, get rid, I wanted to add some extra, I want to split this gauge fixing into something, uh, let's say this, sorry. I suppose that there is some part of the, of, the, of, the, of the symmetry that I want to sort of gauge fix separately from the rest. Okay, so there was some other, there was a set of constraints that I once I want to use explicitly, and there was some other constraint I wanted to add to completely gauge fix the system. So it means I have some other some other gauge fixing condition. Now, I might decide to just uh, I might decide to just do part of these integrals, just get rid of these uh, conditions a bit by hand. So I could, for example, just do the integral, the Grassmann integral over the B tilde S. Okay? That will just pull down uh, something like that, an insertion of the seagulls. And then I can by hand do the, the B integral, say, and put the delta function of a field. Okay. So So sometimes when there is a little mismatch between my gauge fixing conditions and whatever diffeomorphisms I'm actually using, these sort of mismatches can be dealt with by appropriate insertions in your path integral. So if you want to do some gauge fixing by hand afterwards, no, after you did your BST quantization, you can add your gauge fixing as long as you're accompanied by an appropriate ghost insertion. Okay. So, um, the reason I mentioned this, unfortunately, sorry, this was one, one or two things that I was hoping to mention on Friday and I didn't get a chance to. And uh, I'm sorry that it has to be transplanted inside this lecture uh, this way. So, in order to study correlation functions on the cylinder, we also need, we need some brass and we need some cats, okay? So, I define some G and G prime there, and there is some other 
dual states that I can define. And the one is naturally dual to to this G is the one that will be killed by the CNs. But the one that has actually, so the, the non-zero inner product between the states, the only meaningful non-zero inner product in the states is this one. So uh, pretty much because you want the you want the thing on the left to be killed by everything which is not killed by which does not kill the thing on the right, and vice versa. So here you want something that is killed by C zero and C zero bar because they do not kill. So to do that, I, I, I need to put by hand some zero and C zero bar. Now in the context of, uh, of bridge fixing, these are exactly the sort of insertions for these extra diffeomorphisms that translate or rotate the, uh, the cylinder. I mean, so this by itself is just a step in the quantization of the theory of Gauss. It has nothing to do with actual gauge fixing. Uh, this theory, I quantize it, and this is the only thing that makes sense. But in the context of, of the gauge fixing, this is intimately connected with the fact that there were some extra uh, diffeomorphisms on the, on the cylinder that had not been gauge fixed. So that your your original integral wanted to be an integral over not all the formorphisms, but over all the formorphisms which act non-trivially on your matrix. So you had to really put by hand a delta of over your vector fields, over your coordinate transformations, which would kill the the, the, the constant vector fields. So on to something like delta of constant vector fields. And this, so this delta of constant vector fields is accompanied by the constant C, constant mode of the, of the C ghost. Uh, notice all the all the equations I write here, I write for the holomorphic part, and then there are identical equations involving the bar and C bar. Okay. So every, every time I write something for the uh, for the C and C and B, there are identical things written down for C bar and B bar. So behind. Uh, okay. Now it turns out that these ground states. Although the most natural on the cylinder are actually not very convenient for, for a lot of calculations. Uh, in particular, they're not invariant under BFT symmetry. So if you act with the BFT generator over these ground states, you don't get zero. Uh, to show this, I will have to write down the BFT charge, which is a kind of a long expression, and I, I don't want to do that. Um, but you see, there is a simple way to understand why. So we want this sort of things to be true, that the variation of B 
is the stress tensor. So if you want to think analogously to the, to the free boson, we would like to consider some sort of state which is annihilated by uh, all Lns with n given equal minus 1. This is also true for the free boson, for example. Um, and because the BRT symmetry relates Bs and Ls, relates the tensor and, and Bghost, we want to, it's natural to consider a state which has a similar property under the action of the Bs. So it's natural to define some state zero, which is annihilated by uh, all the Bs, including B minus 1. And so this, you, you can write this zero, sim, this state, simply as B minus 1 G. This automatically will be killed by B minus 1. And then this is not going to be killed by C1 anymore. So it's going to be killed by the Cn or n uh, greater than uh, 1. So the standard, so the ground state can be written as C1, zero, well, C1, C1 bar. So I'll talk, we could do all the calculations we want in terms of these ground states. Uh, for future reference, it will be useful to do calculations instead using this as the reference state. Okay. Uh, it, the, the real reason will be clear only uh, in a lecture or two when we start relating the cylinder calculations to calculations on the plane or on the sphere. But for now, just uh, let's accept the fact that there is a a useful state, zero. It's not a ground state. It's a bit more energy than the ground state, but it's a nice feature that is actually killed by the BRT uh, transformations. OK. I'm sorry, it, it's difficult to give a, a completely linear uh, path of thought because somehow the, the, the whole story is not completely linear. There are, there are different, uh, some of the choices are made, uh, made so that things will work later. And it's difficult to, it's not always easy to justify them immediately. Uh, hopefully by the end, things will be a bit more clear. But for now, this is a reasonable motivation. Uh, so for example, when you describe things like normal ordering, it will be with respect to this state. Uh, so let's try to define the, the, the stress tensor uh, quantum mechanically now. So we do this point splitting. Yes. But why choosing that set, uh, I mean, choosing to write a metric like this doesn't fix mm -hmm. the whole, I mean, the whole symmetry that I have on the yes. Why are there just 
being contradicted to Jesus. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're there. They're all uh, with their respect, but if, if, if I read my message in that respect, they yes. treat me with respect to this future moment mm -hmm. of Jesus, right? Yes. Why doesn't it fit with all So essentially, it means this is not a complete gauge fixing. So there's still a little bit of gauge symmetry left. To get rid of it, we pretty much uh, do it by, we can sort of do it by hand. Put by hand a, a delta function which restricts the integral over all coordinate transformations only to coordinate transformations which, um, well, I mean, you can do your choice uh, in different ways, but roughly you want coordinate transformations which uh, do not arise from this constant vector field. Uh, at least infinitesimal is a well-defined notion. And, uh, and we really only care about things that are uh, close to our gauge fixing condition anyway. So if I want to do that, I need to introduce an extra delta function. Uh, but it says to do it properly has to be accompanied by some, some ghost insertion. See, in a sense, because I have a slight mismatch between the Bs and the Cs, if you want. Because the Bs were introduced Bs only for the gauge fixing through the metric, but the Cs are associated to the, dif to the, to the diffeomorphisms. So there are some Cs which are not fixed uh, by changes to the metric. So, okay, so we, we can give this definition. What happened? No. I don't know what happened to the front blackboard. Uh, so we can go through the same motions that we went through in the case of the free boson. And the result is that you can write it as normal ordering, uh, which means the same expression minus the expectation value on the vacuum plus 13 over 12. Uh, yes. This should be compared to the minus 1 over 24 that we found for the free boson. Now, at this stage, of course, it's still, it's still not clear why this is, has to do with the wild anomaly, right? Uh, I made a choice of vacuum, which is not even the natural one. Uh, so at the moment, it's just a number that happens to be 26 times uh, the one for the free boson. And if you want to really see the anomaly, I need to compute the Virazo algebra. So I start with this definition. I take my modes. Or better, I start computing things like the commutator between the L's and C's the commutator between the L's and B's, and then I use them to figure out what is the commutator between the L's and the stress tensor. And finally, I get the commutator between the L's. And the crucial point is that the central charge inside this commutator is minus 26. Yes. I define it like this. So I subtract the expression value on this vacuum. But essentially, essentially I put, means I put to the right all the modes which kill this vacuum. Now again, you could ask me why, why didn't you do it with respect to the uh, G vacuum. But. Yeah, 
Sure, sure. So when you bring them across to each other to put them in the order you want, you put minus signs. So, okay, so doing these calculations is, is possible. Uh, with Mathematica, you can do it in, in two minutes. By hand, it's a little bit tedious. Uh, but the end point is this. So this shows you that if you want to do boson extreme theory, you need to put together uh, 26 free bosons describing your space time and the ghosts. Together, give you zero central charge for your stress tensor and make, make it so that things make sense. For example, you square equal to zero only holds if uh, there are 26 bosons. Uh, uh, now, today, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, writ I've written down the calculation for the, oh, I think today, rather than trying to go through these steps, which are really not particularly illuminating, I would like to discuss a bit more the properties of, the, of this ghost number current. Uh, which disappeared from the board. Ah, over there. Okay. So again, we can define it by point splitting. This way. And then you can start computing things about it. For example, you can compute the expectation value on this vacuum. So you will find that this is the same as the sort of normal order definition. Minus three halves. So what does it mean? It means that this state has Gauss number minus three halves, has charge minus three halves under the rotations which rotate C with charge one and B with charge minus one. The ground state has Gauss number minus one half. And because we get it from here uh, by adding by acting uh, with uh, C one. Notice there are two independent ghost numbers. One is acting on the C B and C and the other on B bar and C bar. So I'm just referring to the one which acts on C and B. Then if I act with another uh, C to get the other ground state, I get plus one half. Okay. So, so you see that the, defi the definition of at least things make make sense, right? There is a sort of a symmetry in the definition between the uh, of of C of G and G prime. Uh, Similarly, the dual state also has charge minus one half, which should help understand why this is what makes sense. The, um, if this is charge minus one half, and this is charge minus one half, uh, it's better to have charge one.
Now, so as I mentioned, the gross number current is actually conserved in flat space. So as long as you're on the cylinder, you're fine. But things get interesting if there is a bit of curvature. Now, or if you want to get interesting under, under wild transformations. So to see that, uh, it's useful to compare the definition of the current we gave in some coordinate system with the definition of the currents we might give in some other coordinate system. So if I try to use the exact same definition but in different coordinate system, right, I'm going to subtract something slightly different. Because I'm going to subtract something like this. I mean, suppose I have some other coordinate system as tilde of S. Suppose I should write it like this. So the difference between the things I subtract in one coordinate system and ones I subtract in another coordinate system is this expression. This expression is finite, but it's not zero. If you take the limit as the spring goes to S, you get a finite answer, which, uh, sorry, my bad. B and C themselves transform in an interesting way when I do coordinate transformations. Because they had, I mean, one had a upper index, the other had uh, lower indices. So actually under coordinate transformations you get uh, some rescaling of this and this. So the, the things I should really compare are not this, but actually uh, this coming from the, from the B transformation. And this coming from the ghost, from the C ghost. So the C ghost transforms like a vector field, so in the opposite way as the current dx that we saw, while B transforms with twice the fact the second power of the factor which will associate to a current, because there's two lower indices. So if you do this limit, you get minus three halves. This the S squared S tilde over the S, S tilde. So these factors are definitely important in determining what is the final answer. It may, go, may ghosts have been different types of objects. Uh, then the answer here would be uh, different. Uh, so For example, if instead of having this sort of, uh, instead of being ghost, right? So instead of being fan fancy uh, Grassmann odd objects with, with bosonic uh, spin like this, if it had been more standard things like fermions, just free fermions, then these factors would have, these powers would have been different. Most of the formula would have looked pretty much the same here. The formula would have been looked the same if B and C were just fermions, free fermions. But here you would have had something like a one half and a half, and, half, and you would have gotten just zero. So if you have three fermions, the, the current that rotates them is just perfect, well, well behaved. But when you have this ghost, which has this sort of peculiar uh, space, space time indices, you get these more interesting results. Well, B has to behave like your metric because you use the metric to gauge fix. I mean, B has to behave like capital B. And also, at the end, because of this relation to the stress tensor, we want it to behave like a stress tensor. So it has to, the same kind of indices we use for stress tensor. And C has to be similar to vector field. Uh, so actually, right, if you not so originally we, we put the, in, the, the index of C low and the indices of B up. 
but uh, so what we are calling here CZ is pretty much the same as a C Z bar. Uh, and so on. But this particular choice, so we raise and lower the indices so that the final action is simple in, uh, in these complex coordinates. Okay, so starting from this and from this sort of relations, you can keep playing around and you can find what the commutation relation is between L's and J's. The, the Fourier modes of the ghost current. So see the, the current transforms much like the current we found for the boson. Remember it was commutation ratio was ln am equal to minus m am. But there's an extra term, a central term, a, a number, which pops out in some of the commutation relations. And because the stress tensor controls how the how correlation functions change as you change the metric, because of this extra term here the behavior of the current is going to be uh, somewhat unexpected when you change the metric. So in particular, you can compute something, for example, like this. Uh, sorry, when I, when I put the zero here, I limit C0, C0 bar. Sorry. Now, the conservation of the current in sort of holomorphic coordinates is just the same as the del S bar JS is zero. Okay. And as before, in the presence of a stress tensor, this fails as a location of the stress tensor. The derivative of this is going to give me a delta function. So if I use my stress tensor to just make a change in the metric, on the cylinder, I'm going to find a violation of the conservation law, which is roughly you know, three times the curvature, if you do things properly. And this, this, uh, this three will be rather important in what, in what follows. So for example, if I work on a sphere, the, the, the Gauss current, Gauss number current will be conserved, will fail to be conserved by three, uh, and so on. So it means that the, this, if I put, look at the operators I place on a sphere, I have to have three more, go, three more Cs than Bs if I want to have something that makes sense and is not zero, and so on. Okay, so I, now I think we have accumulated all the tools that we need to do a calculation of a, well, almost all the tools. We need to, to start computing scattering amplitudes of, of strings. So we have our ghosts, we have our scalar fields, we understand them rough more or less on a cylinder. So next we have to understand how to have these cylinders come together into a uh, smooth surface and how to compute the amplitude for that process.